you are on camera. Today is December 11th, 2020. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer at the History Center. And with me today is Tony Hilliard, who's also a volunteer at the History Center. And Sue Verhoff, who is the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the Atlanta History Center. We're honored to have with us today Mr. Charlie Llewellyn. Mr. Llewellyn is a veteran who served two tours in Vietnam. And he's kindly agreed to come in here and tell us about his life, his life story, and particularly his military experience based on what we've heard so far is fascinating. And we're also honored to have Mr. Llewellyn's daughter, Lisa Anderson, who is joining us today. And this is part of the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. And Mr. Llewellyn's story will be recorded for posterity and put at the uh, Library of Congress and also the Atlanta History Center. Mr. Llewellyn, we really appreciate you coming in today and look forward to hearing your story. Would you give us your full name and the city and state where you live now? My name is Charlie Revis Llewellyn. I was born in Temple, Texas in 1939. Okay. And where do you live now? I live in Temple, Texas. <laughs> I moved back there in, uh, well, I came back to Temple in 1995. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Well, all my life, young life, was spent in Temple. I went to, to Temple uh, schools. I was, went uh, through uh, first grade through 12th grade in the Temple School District. Uh, I attended two years at uh, Temple Dock Junior College, two years at uh, North Texas, and uh, then uh, I joined the uh, Texas National Guard uh, and I served with them for a few years. Uh, I went to OCS and uh, got my commission in uh, 1964. Did you have brothers and sisters? No, I'm an only child. Okay, me too. <laughs> um, when you went to OCS, or let's say when you went into the military, uh, did you were you drafted or did you volunteer? No, I volunteered. Okay. And how'd your family feel about that at that time? Well, they were for it. They yeah. they had no uh, no uh, negative uh, feelings about it at all. Okay. And what year was this when you would have gone into the military at first? Four February nineteen. 57. 57, okay. Okay, continue with uh, your description of what you did after you went in, your training, and before, you know, between then and when you went to Vietnam. Well, I went, to, uh, went into OCS, uh, graduated OCS, uh, immediately went to officer basic uh, course at Fort Benning, uh, came back uh, for a short period of time, and uh, was called out of the National Guard to uh, be uh, active duty to uh, 1st Infantry Division at Fort Riley, Kansas. I was assigned to the 1st Battalion, 26th Infantry. Uh, we trained initially. Uh, we had a one brigade of the division was uh, alerted to go to Vietnam in uh, the summer of uh, 65 and we began to feel like the rest of us were gonna go and sure enough we were we received uh, our orders to go we left to go to Vietnam in September of 1965 and uh, we uh, we loaded out and 
went on our way. We flew in the uh, Lord, I can't remember that aircraft. It was anyway the aircraft we flew in was designed by uh, Howard Hughes, and we landed in uh, Oakland, uh, loaded on ships, and uh, we headed out. Uh, and life on the sea was uh, rather uh, interesting. Yeah. We uh, we got into the edge of a typhoon. We were in that for a while. We landed in Oakland. Uh, we had to get off the ship, and uh, we all wondered why the the uh, the dock wasn't moving under our feet. We'd become so accustomed to the ship moving, <laughs> and we got back on the ship and uh, headed on into Vietnam. And we got into Vietnam on the 16th of uh, October, and uh, we actually offloaded into landing craft and went in and uh, made our landing and moved uh, into an assembly area. And then uh, eventually we uh, met, met up with our equipment and we started moving into areas they had assigned us for base camps. That rather, rather strange, the uh, Viet Cong were not all that interested in attacking uh, American troops at that time so uh, it was a little bit, uh, a little strange uh, war for us. Uh, things were not, not very hairy at the time. Uh, later on they got hairy. Uh, the Viet Cong initially would run a, 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 a ambush and then they would they would move. They would get out of the way. They were fast. Uh, we we couldn't find them. They'd hit and run, hit and run, hit and run. Uh, I lost uh, one of my fire team leaders, Willis Weber, on the seventh of November of 1965. And our base camp was named after him. Huh. And. Uh, I, I talked to Weber on the stretcher before they carried him out, and I, I, that had a big impact on me right there. The next day, uh, we were coming back in from a road security mission, and I was on the side of a tr uh, pick uh, side of a deuce and a half, talking to uh, a lieutenant that was the platoon leader of the. A platoon that was in, up above us, and we got ambushed again, and that's when I got shot, and that was on the seventh of November of 1965, which was Reagan's second uh, yeah. election day. Yeah. Huh. Never forget that. Yeah. I was taken in to the, uh, the, the brigade hot, uh, clearance station and taken on back to the third surgical hospital in uh, Da Nang and then evacuated uh, out for a while and before I came back to join my unit. So about how long were you out before you came back? Approximately, not, not exact days, but was it like? Well, I was out. Golly. Oh. Was a it? A month or so. Okay. A month or so about, about that before I came back in. Okay. And the big, big thing uh, that I remember about that is when I got back and joined my unit, I got word that from the company commander he's, that they wanted to see me in his, in his, uh, in his office. I went in and uh, was sitting, he had me sit down, and he threw my purple heart at me. <laughs> I'll never forget that. He was one of these guys that uh, you didn't get a medal if he didn't get a medal, so. Good grief. That's, uh, 
it, no big deal, but that's the way it happened. Um, then uh, shortly after that, I was reassigned to another uh, platoon in the battalion, and the company commander, Hugh Fisher, was a fantastic guy. I loved that man. In fact, he, he I know where he lives, and I keep in contact with him uh, even today. Uh, uh, we, uh, we really started running into a lot of things. We, uh, we had a uh, air assault mission, and I have some pictures of the air assault mission. The helicopters in the air, uh, I took these uh, photographs, a uh, very, very tight formation of helicopters. Uh, not like what people see today of, of quote, helicopter formations. Uh, these guys were in tight. Huh. And we went into War Zone D and we followed a B-59 uh, bombing mission. Uh, I have pictures of the bombs going off and our mission was to do bomb, uh, bomb uh, damage assessment. And we flew in right, right at the end of the bombing mission and to see what they did. And we found, we started finding a lot of uh, materials and stuff that the VC could use to do various things. And we got that all stacked up and got it evacuated out and we started moving out. And we went along for several days and we'd get occasional sniping but nothing, nothing real bad. Till we got to an area that was fairly cleared and we started to uh, try and cross that. Uh, then one of the platoon leaders was a little reluctant to cross this area. And Fisher, I looked down and said, Lou, take your machine guns and get up there and cross that area. And we did. <laughs> and uh, we jumped from bomb hole to bomb crater to bomb crater to bomb crater. And we burst into the area on the other side. And uh, that's when we started finding rice, big, big, uh, 100 kilo bags of rice. And I called back and told the company, uh, company commander what we were finding. He said, we'll burn it. And I <laughs> laughed. I said, no, there's no way in, you know what, we're going to be able to burn this. And he he didn't believe me. I said, there's there's bags and bags of this stuff. And we, we started looking and trying to secure it. And I said, no, we're going to need more than what you've got. And he, he came up there and he saw it. And he, he, then he understood what I was <laughs> trying to tell him. What wound up being the largest stock of food stuff captured by uh, the United States Army during the Vietnam War of rice wow. of the VC. It was in the tons and tons of rice. Wow. In fact, it was so much, we had to bring in two CH-47 helicopters and two three-quarter ton trucks to support the rice, uh, to load the trucks up, to bring the trucks into the pickup zone so that we could load the helicopters and fly that out. We did that for about a week. Uh, flying that rice uh, rice out. I have photographs that show us sitting on the rice, uh, loading the rice out, uh, and there's one particular picture that uh, my wife uh, found very, very interesting. I'm holding up a bag of rice and it says, Connell Rice Company, Houston, Texas. Oh. <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, we kept on, we kept on going. Then uh, we had some some other uh, operations where we did search and destroy operations, and it shows us going in, and we 
we're finding hooches, we're burning hooches, and we're finding Catholic churches, uh, very, very beautiful churches in the middle of the jungle. We're finding Buddhist temples in the middle of the jungle. They're very, very, very beautiful, beautiful buildings. And of course, we didn't bother those. Yeah. They, you don't do that. Would you, uh, just to clarify, where was this in Vietnam? Would you describe generally where it was? Basically, it was in most of it was in War Zone D. And where was that? Like on the War map? Zone D was uh, to the northeast of Saigon. Okay. And what rank were you at the time? Second lieutenant. Second lieutenant. Okay. I was a I was a weapons platoon leader. Okay. And uh, we couldn't we couldn't carry the the 81 millimeter mortars uh, all the time going through the jungle. They're no good. Uh, yeah. But they came up with two additional M60 machine guns, and my guys carried those, which gave the the company commander some additional firepower. Yeah. And we stayed with the company commander. And he would use us wherever he thought that would be best. And so he would, you know, we would, uh, we would go wherever he wanted yeah. us to go uh, to lay down fire wow. power. Uh, we, and then we would move out on different missions. We had search and destroy missions. We also had missions where we would go and uh, completely encircle the village and not let anybody in or out. And then they would go in and do uh, search missions in these village. They would conduct uh, MI, uh, would come in and uh, interrogate these people. Uh, they would have medics come in, examine the people. Uh, to see how well they were, if they were needed medical assistance. Uh, we, we had planned on doing this on the 24th of February of 66. Uh, the initial plan was for us to go in on the 24th at about 12 o'clock and cordon this village off. But we had moved the brigade headquarters closer to this village and they said, no, no need to do that. We'll just wait and go in about four o'clock. And uh, okay, but about 12 o'clock, our CAV uh, unit we had with us started receiving some fire, which was a little unusual. And of course they had their uh, 113 personnel carriers when they're 50 cows. Well, they put a stop to that real quick. <laughs> and then the, the fire kind of moved around and they started to try and come in again and they Moo tried to come into the artillery area. Well, the artillery guys just dropped their barrels down horizontal and fired beehive rounds <laughs> at them. Well, that stopped that real quick. And they came on around and then they, I guess they thought then they found the soft spot. Had we moved out, had, had been planned, the only people in the perimeter at that time would have been the cooks, the clerks, wow. the whomever was left behind. But that's not the case. There was a full infantry wow. battalion manning the, uh, the perimeter. Being a weapons platoon leader in where we were that night, I did have my mortars and we had registered our mortars on, and particularly, there was a road we had registered these mortars on. And I got a, I got a fire mission from 
one of my FOs that was with the, uh, one of the, uh, the uh, platoon's uh, squads. And he came back and he gave me his fire mission and it was for this registration point. When we're ready to go for that, and he, but he called for HE, high explosive rounds. It's the only time I've ever, ever overridden what a, one of my uh -huh. FOs called for. And I said, no, we're going to go with Willie Pete, or white phosphorus. And we did. And uh, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say this, but he came back and said, Damn, damn, <laughs> you set them on fire. <laughs> and apparently there was a whole slew of VC out there, yeah. and they were burning. Yep. They were really going, and we, the battle was on, and they, they hit us real hard. And they stormed the whole perimeter at that time. I mean, everything. They just tried to come right on through the wire, because they thought there was nobody there. Uh -huh. And we actually fired the final protective fire for the battalion right then because they were trying to come in. And I have a picture of that, uh, which you, you will have a picture of oh, that too. Wow. And uh, the battle was on and we fought from roughly midnight to, well, it was still light the next morning when we, we were still fighting them. Uh, they were trying real hard to overrun us. We found out later that we were up against three uh, but uh, brigade, three but uh, regiments of NVA. Uh oh well, I was going to ask you when you started seeing NVA, and I guess that was it, wasn't it? That was it. Okay, continue. And uh, boy, it was it was something else. We uh, we had they started trying to break break contact, and we we saw that they had uh, pulled a bunch of bodies off, and they were trying to haul them off in ox carts. And the brigade commander called for our recon platoon to try and get down there and follow them and call airstrikes in on them. And they did that. And uh, they were calling airstrikes in on those guys. But in front of us, we counted over 450 something bodies in front of us wow. that, uh, that we captured or killed. And uh, which was very, very, Oh, it was a gruesome sight. Yeah. And what was rather um, rather strange, 24th day of February was my 27th birthday. Gosh. And <laughs> uh, I got a call, said, come up to brigade headquarters. So I went up to brigade headquarters and a helicopter had landed. And they looked at me and said, get on that helicopter. And they gave me a set of orders and I had been transferred to the 1st Aviation Battalion. Huh. And they said they need pilots in the 1st Aviation Battalion and you're, you're gone. Well now, had you been trained as a pilot? I'd been trained as a pilot. Oh. And uh, back then, pilots were, were drawn from all branches. And it's not like today where they have an aviation branch. Yeah. But then they were drawn from all branches. So you had to keep up your branch qualifications as well as your aviation skills. And uh, wow. so I went back to... Uh, to the aviation battalion. I was assigned to a UH-1 Charlie gunship platoon, which is not really 
politically correct today, but we were known as the rebels. <laughs> and on the side, on the door of each helicopter was painted a stars and bars. Yeah. And on the other side or up above that was a little guy that was draped in a flag and wore a gray costume and a sword <laughs> and it said the word forget <laughs> hell and <Yeah>. it, <laughs> we slept in an area that was uh, south of the Mason Dixon line that we had established <laughs> and our quarters were like the Magnolia Manor I, I mean it <laughs> but the funny thing about it was nobody complained no. and we had everybody every race that wanted to be a rebel yeah yeah and it was it was crazy yeah we uh we had a young man join our platoon who had married the daughter or I think it was daughter of George Wallace who sent us a rebel flag. And we flew that rebel flag yeah. all the time. We went to go to the officers club, we'd fly the rebel flag. Well, from what I remember, it wasn't considered offensive. What wasn't offensive. No, I, I mean, I, man, oh, God. Yeah. We, we, anyway, we couldn't do it today. Yep. Yeah. But anyway, I stayed in the Rebels and until uh, I finished out my tour in Vietnam and uh, flew missions. And we, uh, our old division commander had been uh, promoted to a three star and was the Corps commander. But every time he went out on a mission, uh, somewhere he we'd get a call. He wanted the rebels to fly his uh, protection, huh. and we. I mean, we had a name. We were <laughs> bad guys. We would. <laughs> anyway, it sounds like you had a lot of pride in your unit, and everybody else did there. Oh too. yes, oh yes, <laughs> sure did. Do you ever keep up with any of them? You mentioned one person, but uh, oh yeah, good. Oh yeah. Really do. Okay. Well, continue all this. Well, anyway, I, when I came, uh, when I finished up with uh, my tour in Vietnam with the rebels, I uh, got my orders and they signed me back to uh, to Fort Hood, Texas, and I went back to an infantry unit, and I was assigned to the first battalion, fifty second infantry, at. Uh, at uh, Fort Hood, when I was in uh, when I was in uh, Vietnam, I uh, was injured in a crash of an OE on Mohawk, uh. and they <coughs> took me off flight status uh, due to back injury. Uh. So I went back to the infantry. Uh, now, when, when was this? Was it after you'd gotten back? To Vietnam? No, it was when I was in Vietnam. Okay. Right at the end of my tour. Oh, your first tour. Yeah, my yeah. first okay. tour. I got yeah. banged up in a crash. Huh. Anyway, uh, so I went back to Fort Hood, Texas, and uh, was there. They uh, were forming the 198th Light Infantry Brigade, and uh, I wound up in that unit and went to, back to Vietnam almost one year to the day that I had come back huh. okay. and uh, deployed back to Vietnam and went into the i Corps area and became part of the Americal Division. And I Corps North. I Corps is the furthest north. one north. Right. And 
we uh, we were actually committed to battle as the 198th uh, Light Infantry Brigade. So uh, I can wear three different combat patches yeah. if I desire. Uh, but they anyway, they formed up the AmeriCal Division and took the 198th, 196th, and 11th Infantry Brigade to form that division okay. uh, when the 11th got there. And uh, of course, there was all these different uh, D-Row states, and they were fighting that. So they did an infusion program, and I got infused down to the 11th Brigade. Uh, and when I went down there, I uh, initially uh, I was assigned as the assistant S3, uh, uh, S3 assistant S3 of Task Force Barker. Uh, this is the unit that conducted the Melee raid and uh, went to uh, LZ Dotty and uh, actually was the night duty officer in the Tactical Operations Center. During me life? Well, this was before me life. Okay. And uh, we, while we're on a pause, there'll be people watching this that won't know the terminology like all of us do, but explain what DROS is for somebody that's not familiar with that. That's your that's your rotation date back to the to the, to the states. That was our favorite word, right? Oh yes. <laughs> oh okay. yes. Okay. okay. And uh, they uh, in February of uh, sixty. Trying to think, in February of '68, okay. Task Force Barker had uh, been in to what they referred to as the Pinkville or Melee, and uh, had uh, conducted an operation in there, and had taken some very, very heavy casualties. Uh, this area was the home of the 48th Main Force Battalion. This was the first battalion of the uh, uh, the Viet Cong that was organized when they started their rev uh, revolution against the South Vietnamese government. Uh -huh. And they were very strong, very anti-South Vietnamese government, and uh, they they had quite a battle. Uh, they had uh, been in there and had uh, some casualties. They had received mortar fire, uh, a number of uh, different things that happened to them. They were really interested in getting back in there. And uh, so on uh, March 16th, 1968, they planned this raid back into it. And uh, so being the night, talk, night duty officer, uh, I didn't have anything to do with the planning uh, of it or anything, but uh, I, I, I listened listen to it uh, as it started with the helicopters coming in and everything and I thought hey this is this is pretty interesting so I went out to my uh, sleeping area and picked up my little recorder I had and uh, went back in and got into an area that uh, I would be out of the way and nobody would uh, stumble over me and I started recording this stuff, and uh, I recorded the uh, transmissions from the helicopters uh, to the Tactical Operations Center. Uh, I couldn't get the transmissions from the ground because of a hill blocking the 
transmissions of the FM radios. But uh, very interesting to get the the uh, transmissions from the uh, aircraft in the air. Yeah. And it's very interesting to hear uh, what some of the pilots have to say. And what they refer to as uh, so many dinks here and so many dinks there mm -hmm. and uh, what they've dropped red smoke on and what they've killed here and what they've killed mm -hmm. there. Uh, it, it's <coughs> quite interesting. This recording was used by General Pierce in his investigation of the My Lai uh, oh. Oh. raid. And it pr helped him establish a timeline of events that happened during the raid. And uh, I mentioned in his book uh, that he wrote after the My Lai raid, or after he retired, really. And uh, it's, it's, this is how, you know, what, what, he, what he put in his book. So uh, that happened a lot. But anyway, after after Meli went well, back. Before we leave Meli, I'm just interested, if you don't mind commenting on this. You know, I had not gone over at that point, but we were all reading about Meli and seeing it reported on the news, and we still hear about it. I mean, you had a, it, maybe not an eyewitness view, but you probably knew as much about what happened as anybody. Was that reported accurately? And I know that's a general question, but looking back on the way it was reported here and the, what's been written about it, do you feel that it was fairly reported? Uh, you don't, if you don't feel comfortable to, answering to that. To a degree, that's to a degree, yes. Okay. Um, I, I believe it was. And the reason is, let me carry on just a minute. Sure. And maybe you'll understand. Sure. Uh, I went back after Meli, or after Task Force Barker was dissolved. I went back to the 11th Brigade, and after the 11th Brigade, I was transferred back to the United States. My assignment when I came back was it to Fort Benning, Georgia. In Fort Benning, Georgia, I was assigned as the headquarters company commander of the infantry brigade at Fort Benning, which is a very nice job to have. One day I got a call from the brigade commander's secretary that the brigade commander wanted to see me. So I, I went down and she said, go on in, he's waiting to see you. I walked in, as soon as I started in, he got up from behind his desk, started around his desk, and started to sit down on the couch he had in there, which was very unusual. And he said, Lou, sit down. That was very unusual. So I sat down and I thought, what in the world have I done now? <laughs> and he said, Lou, I'm fixing to assign a lieutenant to your company. And this is going to have very, very uh, bad reputation, or bad uh, rep uh, reputation, repercussions for the Army. And he said, you're going to be besieged with reporters, and your constant answer is, I have no answer, and you go to the, the, the uh, PIO at uh, the uh, post headquarters. Okay. okay. And he said, you're to go to the post commander's uh, office. They have the uh, 
201 file for the individual. They will only give it to you. You pick it up. You take it back to your office. You look at it, see what needs to be done. You take and do whatever you need to be done. Take it down to our personnel. Give it to them. And that ends it. So I went up and got it, looked at it, and the name was, of all things, Rusty Callie. Mm -hmm. So I wound up being Bill Callie's company commander at Fort Benning. Mm -hmm. <sighs> that, uh, that was a little bit hard. Yeah. Um, there was one time and he was sitting in the office and I was talking to him and just sitting there talking and not uh, thinking about anything uh, I just asked him point blank Rusty what happened? And he looked at me and he said, well, Captain, it just got out of hand. Okay. Well, unfortunately, that couldn't be used against him because he hadn't been advised of his rights. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that, um, that kind of ended that there. But the, uh, what was funny was that uh, uh, nobody would tell me anything uh, as, as to what was going on. And I was talking to the uh, brigade JAG officer one day and uh, was asking some questions about it. And out of the clear blue sky, for some reason, I asked him, does this have anything to do with an operation in Vietnam? on March the 16th in the village of My Lai. And his reply was, well, what do you know about it? I said, I don't know a lot about it. I was there. <laughs> and he immediately said, don't you say another word. And he hung up. He called me back a little bit later. He said, the judge advocate general at the division will be calling you. Oh. So wow. they did, and uh, they wanted to see me. And uh, I went up there, and uh, the, uh, they, they talked to me, and they had a very, very poor recording of what you guys have got. And uh, I laughed at them, I said, I. I got something better than that. I got the original tape. <laughs> and they, they didn't know what to think. So I spent a lot of time with the tapes and yeah. getting them, you know, getting things for them and, and uh, helping them out. Um, I wound up uh, Christmas, uh, oh God. About four days before Christmas, I got uh, I got a call from the brigade duty officer. Who said you're supposed to be in Washington D.C. Uh, tomorrow morning. God. And I thought, hey guy, you're not going to get a flight out of out of here. And I, I said, you know, it's impossible. He said, no, you'll be there. Uh, and I, I called him. I, he said, this is impossible. I tried to get a flight, and I called him back. He said, no flights. He said, wait a minute. He called back a few a few minutes later and said, you're on flight such and such, and this is your, okay. Sure enough, I was there. Got off the plane in knee-deep snow. Anyway, anyway, but that was to testify before the Pierce Commission. Oh. And you, and te that you was, testified? That was, uh, Yeah testified before uh, the General Pierce Commission. Uh, that was uh, quite an experience to be uh, 
eight stories down in the uh, the Pentagon and uh, I testified there and then came back home. Then uh, I went, uh, had to testify in Article 32 investigations mm -hmm. at Fort Meade, Maryland. And I don't remember how many Article 32 investigations I had to to uh, testify in, but it was a large number. And it seemed like you would get out of one and you would go to another. Just get out of one and go to another. Uh, and it, it, it was crazy. <laughs> Were these invo all involving in Milai? All in Milai. Okay. They, the, Pierce, I, I don't have a lot of respect for General Pierce because the Statue of Limitations was getting very, very close, and he just threw charges at anybody and everybody. Oh. Just because the charge, the uh, the time was running out, and yeah. he didn't want to miss anybody, and he ruined a lot of careers yeah. because of that. Gosh, and and that's that's not right. No, no. And when only you know, Medina and and uh, Cali were the only ones. That, well. Henderson was tried, and that's a story in itself. What, what is that story? <laughs> Henderson? Yeah. Well, I had uh, I had gotten out of the service because I was just uh, I was just tired of all the malarkey that you <laughs> had to put up with. That's I couldn't take it anymore, and. Uh, I got a call saying I had to go up to testify in the Henderson trial. And I told them, well, I'm, you know, I'm not sure I want to do that. And they said, well, either you do it or we'll issue a warrant. <laughs> and you'll come up with, uh, yeah. okay, with federal officers. I, yeah. I said, well, <laughs> anyway, I went up to Fort Meade, Maryland and went in and I was the third uh, person to testify for the prosecution and I wound up being the third person to testify for the defense <laughs> but I, uh, I testified pretty well for for Henderson and really did was more of a defense witness than I was a, uh, a, a uh, prosecution person but they asked me a lot of stuff about him Colonel has he was all right what was the result of the Henderson matter he uh, found not guilty okay okay and uh, Medina was found not guilty yeah. and there was some sergeants tried down at Fort Hood they were found not guilty mm -hmm. Okay. So that uh, the only one that really served anything was Rusty Kelly. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, later on, he was pardoned by Nixon. Right. Well, you know, that's fascinating to hear you talk about that because we, we've probably learned more about that whole matter today than we've learned reading everything we've ever read, just from listening to you. But it, uh, it, it, it hurt the Army. Yeah. Uh, we learned a lot from it. Uh, I hope nothing like that ever happens again. But um, it, 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 and it hurts me yeah. uh, to be, you know, to be part of that. 
even though I didn't do anything, yeah. but to be part of, of Task Force Barker, to know that, I, it, I don't have a good feeling yeah. about that. But it's something that needs to be told. Yeah. And that's the reason I'm here. I think people need to know from those of us that yes. were there as to what happened. Well, you're doing a real service to the Army and to the country, I think, for, for well, talking about this. I hope this, I hope this happens. And will will educate people in the future. I'm sure it will. Let's go back while you're in your second tour of Vietnam, and I'll be sh I want to be sure we don't miss anything there. I definitely want to talk about Tet of '68 and your involvement, but let's wind the clock back a little bit and uh, tell us anything more about, in addition to Tet of '68, your your second tour of Vietnam. Well, initially, when I got there, we we landed uh, the 198th Brigade. We landed at uh, at Chulai. Uh, we moved out, uh, set up a base camp uh, fairly close to Chulai. Uh, which was nice. Uh, being a Vietnam vet, which there were not many Vietnam vets at that time, um, I got uh, selected to uh, participate in the Vietnam Vet School or Vietnam Training School uh, the division was running. And uh, I uh, was at Chu Lai when the, during the Tet Offensive and we got hit, and we got hit hard with uh, 122 millimeter rockets. I thought they <clears throat> would never stop coming in. Um, we were we were over close to a uh, Marine. Yeah, it was a Marine uh, Air Corps bomb dump. And they were supposed to have these bombs separated a certain distance and so many bombs in a pile and everything. Well, they had them all piled up in one <laughs> one pile and they got hit. Oh. And that was the biggest uh, explosion I think I've ever seen uh, or heard. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, I was in a sand, sand dune at the time. <laughs> But uh, it, it blew our camp, oh, did tremendous damage to our camp. Uh, and I had to get out and start looking for people to make sure everybody was, you know, safe. And we'd, I'd go into these hooches and these floors would just, uh, l like you were on a springboard, they would just give. <laughs> it, it was crazy. Wow. Uh, but Tet was bad. Had a friend that was a uh, pilot in this uh, outfit. And uh, later, next couple of days, I went over to see what was going on. And uh, he gave me a big chunk of windshield uh, out of one of the aircraft. And apparently that aircraft had taken a direct hit with one of the rockets. And it, it, it just totally destroyed that aircraft. Jeez. But uh, yeah, that was now that was probably the scariest I've ever been. Yeah, it was under fire like that. Well, I can understand that. So, when Tet was over, or the Tet offensive was over, what difference did you see, if any, in the activity? that was going on, in other words, enemy activity. Did it have a impact on the number of North Vietnamese and Viet Cong in your area and their activity, or did it slow down after that, because so many of them got killed? Well, the Tet, is, Tet uh, 
cause the the Americans to really step up their yeah. their um, their uh, activities in the area. The yeah. Americans went after them yeah. really big, yeah. and um, they went after the Viet Cong via, uh, NVA. Yeah. And so we didn't have a lot of trouble after that. Yeah. Uh, we had a place called uh, Rocket uh, Rocket Alley, and we didn't find many. Uh, uh, rockets and stuff up in there. Uh, then they, they just uh, they stopped it. Yeah. Well, they thought they were going to take over the country in ten of sixty eight. They thought so, they, yeah. And they failed. So, yeah, because of units like yours. And uh, they even had they even had my trainees out on patrol. Huh. They had my they had my instructors and me. We were up we were up in the in in uh, we did the 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 uh, rocket uh, alley yeah. uh, training up through there. Wow! And uh, we found nothing. Boy, but they had those guys. Were, boy, I tell you, that crudest way they way they did things. Crude, and by they, you, the, the NVA and okay, uh, in uh, Viet Cong, okay, they, they would use a a plumb bob mm -hmm. yeah. and get it set at a certain angle off the rocket, and they might have a bucket filled with water, and a in that they would have a a, a piece of wood floating. And under that piece of wood, they'd have a metal piece attached to it onto a wire. And same thing on the bottom of the bucket and a piece of wire there. And that, when that water evaporated and those two made contact, that rocket would fire. <laughs> Phew, it's gone. There's nobody around. <laughs> and, you know, and we wondered why we were getting... Yeah. Getting uh, rockets at all crazy hours. That's why. That's very interesting because we've interviewed a lot of Vietnam vets, and I know I was there. That I've never heard about that. That's amazing. My uh, my wife and I went back to Vietnam in 2009, okay. and I've talked to a lot of vets. Oh no, I can't go back. I couldn't go back. They should go back. They really should. We uh, we went to Kuchi. Now Kuchi is where the the uh, VC had the largest tunnel complex that just happened to be underneath the base camp of the 25th Infantry Division. <laughs> And the uh, Vietnamese government has turned this thing into a commercial venture. Some of the some of the rooms that were closer to the surface, they have uncovered them, covered them in tin, and fixed it so that it doesn't get wet in there. We got big flat screen TVs. They show you. They give you a presentation in there about the tunnels and everything. They've got these trails that go through. They show you all of the different kind of booby traps that they used. Uh, and I mean, and there's a bunch of them. Uh, all the kinds that you step on, uh, the kinds of the swinging booby traps, you name it. They uh, show uh, Viet Cong uh, in their hammocks in Viet Cong, uh, getting the United States dead missiles and taking the uh, the uh, explosives out of there and using them, making their claymores. It's crazy. And uh, they've got... Uh, my <laughs> They've even got a rifle range in there. My wife and I were walking along this trail, and 
this uh, AK-47 cut loose. And uh, I said an expletive and got <laughs> down real fast because you, yeah. once you hear an AK, yeah. you never forget it. And she thought I was crazy. And uh, I got up and we started going on down. We found this uh, big gift shop looking thing down there. And uh, we walked around and looked at it, and it was a rifle range. And you could buy 10 shells and fire the rifles. You could fire an M16, AK, SKS, whatever you wanted to fire. So I bought the rounds, and we fired the AK. And that's, that's what was firing. And uh, got a picture, which you guys will get this picture. Uh, of, it's uh, called Charlie and Charlie <laughs> <laughs> firing this AK-47. <laughs> so, I mean, that's kind of it. We went on through, and uh, there's pictures of the rubber plantations in there. Uh, it's uh, rather interesting. Rubber plantations owned by individuals are well taken care of. Those owned by the government, well, um, not quite <laughs> up to standard. Uh, it was uh, rice harvesting time, and you see the rice they've got spread out, drying and everything. You see rice in bags. Uh, went over and saw Nui Baden, uh -huh. the Black Virgin Mountain. Yeah. Uh, when I was there, it, uh, we had a radio relay unit up on top. We had to supply it by helicopter. Well, if you want to go up on top of it now, you use a cable car. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, went up and saw the uh, Kaldak Temple at Tain Inn. And went into Tain Inn and had lunch. I mean, yeah. it's totally... It, it's crazy. There's one picture in there that said no more dirt roads. <laughs> there are no dirt roads. They're all paved. <laughs> Did you have any uh, conversations with any Vietnamese that were involved in the war when you were over there? Uh, no. Okay. I felt threatened only one time. One time. We had... We had, a, we had a driver and a translator yeah. with us. And we'd been up to Tain Inn and we'd gone down to, uh, to uh, oh, where, uh, yeah, where we landed down there. I'll think about it. Anyway, uh, we were coming back to Saigon on a toll road <laughs> and had stopped at the booth to pay the toll. Now the old guy that was in there taking the, uh, the toll, if looks could have killed, oh. I would be dead. Really? Wow. And that's the only time that I felt um, threatened. Threatened. Yeah. Wow. But any other time, the people that you met and mingled with had not even been born when the war was over. Yeah, yeah. So they, they had not been exposed yeah. to the war. Yeah. Their big thing was they wanted to get close to Americans. They wanted to talk to Americans. They wanted to be seen with Americans. And um, yeah, that's a that's a good thing. Yeah, it was great. Uh, let's go back to your second tour. I want to be sure that there's nothing that's left out that you want to talk about. Mm, no, not really. I've got a couple of questions that going back to the beginning of your. Your discussion. When you were on the ship coming over to yes, Vietnam, sir. what was the morale like 
the morale of the troops that were going over? It was pretty good. Uh, the big thing is you'd get out of chow line, you'd eat, and you'd go get back in a chow line. <laughs> we, we were pretty crowded. In fact, we were overcrowded uh -huh. on that ship. Um, the guys would, uh, they really didn't have any place to go or anything to do anything. This ship, the General R.M. Blatchford, was a World War II troop ship that they had taken out of mothballs, done minor repairs, and sent it to take us over. There was one small area um, on probably about the size of this room that was assigned to the officers that we could go and uh, play cards or whatever. And that was it. Okay. Uh, so the the enlisted men had all the other space that they could find. Okay. When you first set foot in Vietnam, what was your first impression of what you saw, what you felt? Or? Well, you had the first Air Division band in a boat floating around the ship. Um, it, it, uh, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of, of, you know, wasn't a lot of difference really. You were just getting off the, getting off the LCM, uh, hitting the beach and trying to find the truck. Yeah. Security was tight, okay. and um, so you just you were just trying to follow instructions. All right. All right. And I mean, you've got a, as you pointed out, a fairly unique experience because you went over in '65 for your first tour, and you came back in '68 your second tour. Can you describe anything that you remember that was so different that it made an impression on you from 65 to 68, whether it was our, the U.S. efforts or U.S. soldier or the enemy or the country or the people or, because that's about a, you know, four year, three or four year period of change. Any particular changes of what you saw or what you heard or the feelings of people? between 65 and 68? Actually, no, they're pretty close. Okay. The changes came after 68, 69, 70, and that, that period of time is when the changes started. And uh, we started getting the fraggings uh -huh. of the officers, uh, the heavy uh, drug use. Uh, it, it came after, yeah. after 68. Okay. Uh, we didn't have the, we didn't have the problems then that uh, they had later. Yeah. We were, we were in the clear. Why do you think that was? I don't know. Yeah, I'll, I really don't. Know. I don't either. <laughs> Did you have any opportunity when you were in Vietnam on both tours to deal with the population, you know, the civilians, and the Vietnamese civilians? Well, when you Yes, to a degree, to a degree, yes. 
uh, you could make, there were some, some vendors that you got to know mm -hmm. fairly well. Um, you had to be careful, you know, what you said around them. Uh, they, they, they treated you fairly decently. Yeah. During the, the first tour, we had, we had actual, uh, in aviation, we had Vietnamese uh, help on the office staff, okay. had Vietnamese girls, we, and we got to know them fairly well. Yeah. And they were all crazy as fruitcake. <laughs> But they were they were nice. I mean, they <laughs> they were really nice. Good. When you got back from Vietnam and after your second tour, did you have any issues that I know a lot of I I never had them, but I know a lot of people did of being mistreated by the population at all, either in Oakland or when you got home or. Did, do you have any issues like that? The first time, no. The second time, we uh, were supposed to land in uh, Washington. But as we started our letdown, the famous weather out there changed and we couldn't land, so they said we we're going to land in Portland. Huh. Well, we landed in Portland and uh, to refuel. That was kind of a scary. Uh, thing and we, anyway we got refueled and went on and landed at Travis Air Force Base and we were trying to catch a uh, we got a taxi and we were trying to get down to LAX to, so we could take off and come home and uh, we got stopped by Highway Patrol and he was a real horse's rear end. And since we were Vietnam vets, he laid it on this driver real hard. Chief. And strictly because we were Vietnam vets. And wow. uh, I, I, I didn't like that. He didn't want to hear anything. Basically, he told us to shut up. Good grief. And keep our in there and uh, I, I, I came close to getting out, but uh, it wouldn't have done any good. And for a highway patrolman to be for doing a highway that, patrolman. well, that's horrendous. So, but you come on, you come home, and you get some negative comments. You know, not a lot. Yeah. But uh, you, some negative comments about yeah. Vietnam. Yeah. But just kind of let it blow off and blow yeah. over and let it go. Yeah. So talk about what you did when you got out, just sort of a summary of what you did from that point forward. Well, I say when you got out, when you got back home from Vietnam. Well, when I got out of Vietnam, Decided what you know. What do I want to do? I uh, had gotten out of the army and was looking around for something. And I had a good friend that I'd known for a long time. And I was talking to him. And he said, "Why don't you come to work for me?" And I said, "Okay." Well, he was a he was a civil servant in the National Guard. Huh. And I said, okay. 
So I went to work for him in the National Guard huh. as a National Guard uh, technician. Wow. And so I went to work in, uh, in Dallas and uh, worked for him for eight years. And uh, then he got uh, he got transferred, and the guy that they moved in there was uh, north end of a southbound jackass. And <laughs> couldn't uh, couldn't stand to put up with him anymore. Yep. So I decided I wanted to look for something different. Started looking around and found an opportunity that maybe I could work overseas. So I started looking around and I found an opportunity that I could work overseas with the company and I applied and I was selected. So I went to Saudi Arabia. Gosh. And I stayed there for 16 years. Wow. As a military advisor to the Ministry of Defense in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. That must have been fascinating. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Can you talk about that? Maybe something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, they. I. I got. I. I got to work in in the Navy. I got to work in the Ordnance Corps. Huh. I got to work in the let's see what else was it? Navy Ordnance Corps, the Air Force. Gosh, I can't remember. I, there were four I got to work in. Anyway, the four different branches yeah. of their services I got to work in. Gee. But I worked in basically setting up supply systems for them. Okay. Which was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, I met a lot of, uh, of their high-ranking officers. Yeah. Uh, and they... Uh, they're, they're a lot of fun to be with in some cases. In other cases, they try very hard to convert you to Islam. Yeah. And um, they don't know when to stop sometimes. Yeah. But, um, you know, you yeah. just let it slide off your back. Yeah. yeah. But I enjoy, uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this. <laughs> Well, for 16 years, I had to live by their rules oh, yeah. Yeah. and their regulations. <laughs> and now when they're over in this country, they have to live by mine. <laughs> and if I want to speak to a lady, I'll speak to her. <laughs> yeah. And if I want to speak in her language, I'll speak to her in her language. <laughs> and if I want to greet her, I'll greet her in her language. <laughs> whether they like it or not. And I get some of the most unusual reactions. Here's a Texan speaking Arabic with a Saudi accent, and they don't know what to do. <laughs> That's good. You probably sort of enjoyed that, didn't you? Oh, I love it. <laughs> Well, did you have any family with you when you were over there? I mean, your wife wouldn't have been able to go, would she? Or? My late wife was oh, okay. uh, yeah. was able to go with me. She she, she was. was she was over there. Yeah. Well, that was a great experience for both of you. Oh yeah, she. Uh, my late wife was uh, Colombian. Oh. And uh, yeah, she uh, she got a kick out of it. <laughs> And you've got how many children, or had how many children? I've got three daughters, God. which is kind of a, a unique situation. I have two daughters. One is 53, one is 50. Now, I'll stop. My wife is 70, 
seven. Okay. I'm 81. My third daughter is 21. Well, that's a good balance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Our great granddaughter came to live with us when she was 11 years old. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was been some problems yeah. and so my wife and I took her in Good, wow. and we basically raised her we put her through middle school put her through high school she's now a junior at Texas Tech oh. and we elected to adopt her oh, that's so she would actually have a family and so She's our daughter. That's fantastic that you did that. I mean, that changed her life, I'm sure. She's I, quite a gal. Well, I know all of them are proud of you. Well, I hope so. Is there anything else you want to talk about, either back to your pre-military days or your military service or subsequent to that? Well, so I think that pretty well sums it up. Well, I, I could sit here all day and listen to you talk about your life. It's just, you ever thought about writing a book? Some people have asked me about that. I, uh, I don't know. I really haven't given it a lot no. of thought, but uh, someday maybe it's worth it to do that. It I don't know. It would be. I'd like to ask anybody else if you have any questions. Don't hear. I have just, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Lisa. I just wanted to ask if you wanted to tell them about your donation to the museum and the things you brought back. Oh. Oh, yeah, we'd love to hear that. <laughs> well, during my first tour in, in Vietnam, uh, as an infantry officer, I was a pack rat. Uh -huh. And on operations, we'd find stuff. I would pick it up. And I would always come back with a load of stuff. In addition to my camera and pictures, I would come back with a number of things and throw it in a footlocker throw it in a footlocker, throw it in a footlocker. When I got ready to come home, I just shipped it all home. Quite by accident, I received a, an, uh, an email that was not sent to me personally. I got it on some, accidentally it was forwarded to an individual. And what it was, it was from the First Infantry Division Museum at Wheaton, Illinois. And it involved, they were going to go to Fort Bliss to pick up a flag of an artillery unit that they wanted. Uh, and they were desperately searching for uh, various war trophies from the Vietnam era and they were having a very difficult time finding stuff. And so I thought, got thinking about this, and here I am with all these trunks full of this stuff. Well, I uh, had a talk with my wife, and I had a little difficult time initially uh, getting her to agree to this. She wanted, no, 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 you need to leave it to the kids. I said, they don't know what it is, where it came from, what it was used for, or anything else, and it's just, it's just junk. I said, we need to leave it to a museum where they, number one, will know how to trans, uh, keep it, you know, uh, take care of it, and people can see it. Well, she thought about it, and she finally came around. So I sent this guy an email that I had a bunch of stuff, and would, they might be interested in it. Well, it took a couple of days, and I got an email back from this guy. and He said, yeah, can you send me some pictures? 
So I went out to my boat barn and I got all this stuff and I laid it out on the floor and got up on the boat and shot down and took pictures. And pictures, I took pictures, pictures, pictures and used them as attachments and sent them an email. Man, it wasn't 15 seconds and I got a reply. <laughs> Yes, we'd be you. <laughs> yes, we want it. And here's our FedEx number. <laughs> okay. Well, I wound up shipping them 174 pounds of war trophies. God. And I have the distinction of sending the most Vietnam memorabilia to the museum and also have the distinction of sending the smallest item in the museum. And what was that? If you recall, I said that the artillery lowered their their uh -huh. barrels and fired flechette rounds. Yeah. Yeah. It's a flechette that was actually fired during the Battle of Tambin. Gosh. And it's a little dart about that long with a point on it and four little fins that I got out of a tree. Wow. <laughs> and oh. it's on display up there. Gee whiz. In addition to that, they, they got all kind of uniforms, uh, medical gear, uh, canteens, web gear, uh, foot gear, Ho Chi Minh sandals. Yeah. Well, they got the real thing. Uh, uh, they got, and they got all my flight stuff. They got my flight. They got my helmet, uh, my flight suit, my gloves, uh, every, everything. My survival gear, my switchblade knife. I was telling this last night, and the guy looked at me and said, "Why a switchblade knife?" I said, "Well, if one arm is hurt, how would you open a knife?" Good point. He looked at and said, "Well." He said, yeah, I understand that, a switchblade knife. And I told him about the blade on the other end, it being a, a J-shaped blade. He couldn't understand what that was for. I said, that's to cut parallel, a uh, parachute cord. Yeah, well, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and our, our survival knife yeah. they got. They got. They got survival packs. They got the whole thing. And where exactly is this museum? Just for the first division the, museum uh, is in the, Wheaton, Illinois. And um, okay. Wheaton, Illinois is is uh, is not very far east of Chicago. And it was established back in 1950. Well, actually, the the, uh, the uh, foundation for this was established in '54, I believe. Have you ever heard of Robert McCormick? Yeah. Robert McCormick was a lieutenant colonel in the First Division in the First World War. He was a artillery battalion commander and fired the, the support of the first victory the first division had in the First World War. And he was a big red oneer, and boy did he believe in it. And when he died, he established this uh, foundation he gave a thousand acres of his estate in Wheaton to the city of Wheaton for the sole use of the people of Wheaton, Illinois, 
with the stipulation that no commercial village or commercial enterprise ever be established on that thousand acres. Huh. Never. And he uh, kept a low, large uh, area where his mansion is located uh, and I don't know, his golf course is there. I don't know how many acres, but a big big portion of his property is still there. His air airfield. Um, and he left $54 million to this uh, foundation. Wow. The foundation currently is worth $2.2 billion. And they've established this museum. And uh, it is the most complete museum of the Big Red One I have ever seen. Wow. It is fantastic. Uh, and it's worth anybody's trip yeah. to go see that. It is great. It sounds like it. It is great. I want to ask you one more question to be sure we've got this recorded. What was your rank when you left the Army? Captain. Captain, okay. Is there anything else you'd like to say, either a message to the people that watch this or anything you did to say before or just anything at all? The only thing I'd like to say to people is the motto of the Big Red One. No mission too difficult, no sacrifice too great, duty first. That's great. Well, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming in here. You, you've just got, you've had a fascinating life and you're still having it. And an amazing military career. I mean, you were on the ground, you were in the air, you were involved in a tremendous amount of, com of combat. And what you've done is so unusual. I mean, it's like you're a visionary, the way you've recorded what's happened, what you've got from me lie and what you've got on that uh, thumb drive is just invaluable because it's an eyewitness account of what really happened in all these different situations. And that's so rare that somebody's done that. So I don't know if you even understand how impressive that is to all of us that you did something like that and how many people are going to benefit from it. And you're obviously a good person with the, the adoption of your granddaughter. I mean, that made, a, am sure, an unbelievable difference in her life, and, and still is. So it, it's just been an honor to meet you and to hear your story, and thank you for your service. It was my honor. Can I ask one quick thing? Yes, you can, Sorry. yeah. Just one quick thing. Sure. What do you think about Nixon's pardon of Kelly? How do you feel about that? I think it was the right thing because everybody else got off. Um, it, it just, it's one of those things that just happens. And once it starts, you can't stop it. Yeah. Thank you for your service. Uh, Welcome home. Thank you, Matt.